dark, but hopefully you guys can go ahead and uh, look at it. Although, of course, you do have this in your book. Um, Peter, what's your first instinct on Pressy? Um, if it is the verb pressed, as in somebody pressed the button, um, it's going to have an I subject. And I, I'd, I'd modify what you were saying um, to note that I don't really think there's room in this sentence for a verb with an I subject. Does that make sense? Okay. There's a second possibility for pressy besides coming from the third principal part of this new verb. I'm hoping you guys are being serious about learning the principal parts of the verbs in this vocab lesson. I've had some students in the past, and I'm going to just draw your attention to it orally out loud. Um, I've had some students in the past study for the Lesson 40 quiz and get the quiz and ask, hey, were there verbs in this lesson? <laughs> okay, because they'll look purely at page 279 and notice the third declension nouns, but not turn to page 280 and see good old clamo and premo and uh, we'll narrow. Okay. So this is my little way of making sure everybody takes the time to note there's vocab in this lesson on page 280. Okay. All right. If pressy is not the same thing as pressy, what else could it be? There are some people who, who were part of discussions yesterday in seventh hour and I actually don't want to hear from you. I want to hear from good old Peter. Yeah, it's a participle. It is um, a modified form of pressos, the fourth principal part of premo. What form could incorporate a long I as an ending instead of US? Nicole? Well, I, I, I want you guys to, to very quickly note that pressus is really shorthand for pressus, pressa, pressum. The, the perfect passive participle, or the fourth principal part of the verb, can really incorporate endings of three different genders, masculine, feminine, and neuter. But it can also incorporate all cases in both singular and plural. Um, in other words, pressus is a shorthand way of saying pressus, pressa, pressum, press I, press, sorry, pressy, press I, pressy, presso, press I, presso, and so on. Okay. I don't want to um, press your patience uh, uh, by going through all the endings, but what happens if pressy is masculine? nominative, and plural. And that, in essence, the long I is there to modify the they subject of kesirant. A step further, okay. what's the cookie cutter translation of pressy? The long cookie cutter translation is having been pressed. Sometimes it's okay to shorten it down and say simply pressed, as if I were to say <clears throat> the button pressed by Mr. Burns released the hounds. 
So pressed describes the word button, but it isn't the main verb in the sentence. It's a verbal adjective, uh, aka a participle. Now, what if I um, furthermore tell you that pressy modifies the implied they subject of keserunt, but Peter, who or what word is actually the subject of keserunt? Indirectly, but directly it's the relative pronoun qui. <laughs> now, the, the terrible thing is that, <clears throat> let me just move this, try to move this down. Hello, toolbar, failure. After all of that, now it's gone. Start at Gloria, Peter. This is a fine translation of the sentence. I do know that it, it will sound really clunky and funky in your ears, but it is a possible translation that incorporates the cookie cutter translation of pressy having been pressed. It incorporates the ablative of means, by means of war or by war, modifying pressy. And it sort of reverses the order of the main clause, but it still communicates the same idea. If you want to, okay, although some people think this sounds even funkier, you can say, great is the glory of the soldiers who, having been pressed by war, did not yield. If you want to follow the order of the Latin ideas, magna est gloria, that's A-OK. -okay. It's all right to do that. Okay. Good. Are there other questions? Yes, Athena. Okay. Well, my instinct on that verb is to look it up and to find that waleo, walere, walui. I'm going to be lazy and not write the fourth principle part, it means to be strong. Well, we don't need the two. To be strong or be well. Okay. There's a word that sometimes you hear around Devlin that starts with TH. I hope you hear that elsewhere besides Devlin, but the idea is that we want our students to thrive. Okay, and I know that might seem like a, a stretch for you in translating waleo walera, but it's a good stretch. It's a good translation of that. And um, if you translate it with be strong, that's going to be a okay. If you translate it as thrive, that's going to be okay too. The trick is to notice in this sentence that wallet has a subject, which is. as identified by the ending, sure, but where is the nominative noun that is the subject of wallet? Apopolis, yeah. So nominative singular, subject of singular verb wallet. I dare say that over here, leges, I hope you guys th thought of that and saw it as being nominative plural, as the subject of the plural verb wallet.
So does that sort of make sense? Are you, are you still? Okay, good. I'll, I'll answer questions if, if people still have it, but I like to leave room for, for people to record their own thoughts. Yes. In each sentence where you see maybe, you have to evaluate whether the context is talking about a place or a time. I mean, I, I know you know that, whether it means where or when. In this sentence, I don't think there is a context that allows us to make uh, an exclusive choice. So I would be happy with translating Ubi either as when or as where. Okay, uh, other questions? Woohoo, pass them forward. I'm going to go ahead and pause the recording. All right, um, aside from Sydney and Joy, who don't have the benefit of the lecture that I didn't record yesterday, but will record, um, what questions do you all as a class still have about the third declension broadly before we dive back into using it um, at great length? Joey. Well, I mean, in terms of Friday's test, um, you're going to need to know the vocab. And it's a challenge with the third declension, as we talked about yesterday, to you have to actually work to memorize the gender of the third declension nouns because there's no obvious telltale dimension to them. You're going to decline a sample third declension noun, such as we drilled at the beginning of class with the whiteboards. You're going to need to be able to translate sentences from Latin to English, where if you see a word like hominy, okay, as in Owen, give the hominy who sits behind you a pat on the back. No, no, just a pat on the back as he's holding up his pencil as if you, you were a unicorn, okay? But Jake, I have... You know, I decided that there's a much better uh, recipe for success in this class than anger. It's known as the step form. Okay. So keep your, keep your focus on your own learning. Back to the test. You're going to need to be able to interpret Latin third declension nouns when used in sentences. Somewhat like the translation you guys did last night in exercise A. Like the story of Polyphemus and Odysseus slash Ulysses, which we're, been, we're going to be reading soon. Um, but you're, you're not, Joey, going to need to know things about third declension nouns that I haven't taught you yet. For Friday's test, yes. But as I said yesterday in the lecture, they're really spread over about the next six lessons. There are little snippets about the third declension. Okay. We'll soon pick up the neuter third declension. Not to frighten you, but then we'll do I-stem third declensions. And then we'll do third declension adjectives. Okay. And you guys will feel like you're getting the third degree. Ha, ha, ha. I might, did you have a question for me? That's it. I mean, knowing that uh, Lex is feminine, that Rex is masculine, there's no um, there's no way to get around that except the uh, the process of memorizing it from the vocab list. Yes. Exactly. So when you have a vocab entry on, you know, again, good old homo. Ominous, it becomes really important. By the way, some people think the word homo can be feminine. I've never seen it used that way. I mean, there certainly are human beings who are female. Joy, for example. Okay. <laughs> Emma, for example. But most often, 
most often you'll see this referring to groups of mixed gender or just to guys. So think of it as being masculine. You'll want to memorize the gender. You'll also want to work to memorize the stem change. And one of the things that um, I'll go ahead and repeat from the, the lecture I have to re-record is that quite often the derivatives of these English words are far more um, helpful than you might think in terms of helping you to recall the stem. From homo, you get a phrase like homo sapiens or homo, homo sapiens to describe joy or Cole or joey. Okay. But from hominis, if you hold on to the derivative hominid, okay, you're going to be able to, I hope, recall the stem change that much more readily. Okay. And the same deal with lex, legus. Okay. You're going to have to work to recall that a law is feminine. There's no good reason. Um, but the stem change, again, quite often the derivative words like legislature and legal, they'll not only help you to remember the meaning of this word law, but they'll also help you to recall the stem change. All right, woohoo. Time is really flying, um, much faster than I would like it to. And I was going to dive into the Lesson 40 story with you all for translation purposes today, but that, that isn't quite going to happen. Um, so what we're going to do is start as a group activity. Um, and you can use your whiteboards for this. Workbook, uh, not workbook, that textbook activity exercise B on page 283. We'll be doing this in class over the next couple of days. Um, it's not something that you're going to have to submit for points, but will merely be done as an in-class learning opportunity slash expansion of your familiarity with the rules of Latin. And since we're, we're down to about four minutes left, if we go ahead and use the whiteboard, I think we'll be good. What I'd like to propose is, so you guys know what to expect on a daily basis until we get this finished, a, a matter of snaking through the rows, okay? And we'll have um, Bryce be the tongue of the snake, okay? And then come up this way, down, up, down, up, and Emma will be the tip of the rattle on the snake, okay? Although you make much more pleasant sounds than a rattle, a rattlesnake. So Bryce, I just want one word. And I'm going to try to make this as straightforward as possible as we work on the, this new challenge of third declension nouns, as well as all the old challenges of grammar. If a word is provided to me just as it should be, I will underline it so that everybody knows. Okay. If it's not underlined, um, it means one of two things. Either I forgot to underline it and it's totally correct, or it means that the next person who goes in the rotation can offer to fix it. Okay. Um, but as we move to Cynthia, um, since Militase is totally awesome, let's get a new word from you. It is that idiom, yes. And it, in English, um, it, ha it is two words in Latin. It's also two words, and you can give me either either part of that idiom. But I'm glad you recall that. Um. Garo is actually more like waging war. Um, beginning battle is is a form of committo. How could we alter committo to incorporate the plural third person subject like uh, the soldiers? They. Repeat, please. 
that's almost there. I'm going to go ahead and write it. And did you spell it with an ENT or a U? I, I know. Okay. All right. Okay. Right. Now, that gets us a long way towards finishing this sentence. But commitment, I'm not underlining it for reasons we'll, we'll pin down a little bit later, but that, that's getting us going in the right direction. Um, Owen, do you have a, a comment or? Well, I, I'm, I'm working on, on snaking through the rows, but I appreciate that. Maro, how about another word? Or a fixed to commitment. Spell it for me. Not quite. That's that's the word. It looks like parwas parwa parwam. The word that means small, rather than um, the word that means prepared. Okay. So we're. I'm going to write that. We'll not underline it because we can come back and modify it later. And if you if you want to modify your own word, just raise your hand. Um, but for now, let's go ahead and. Oh my goodness, time is flying, Charles. Like so? Yeah. It isn't quite. You're getting us more in the right direction of taking this as the P cubed or the perfect passive participle of paro. But I tell you what, we're going to have to pause right now. Isabella is going to ring, and I'd like to give you your homework assignment before you run screaming out the door. I know most of you wouldn't like your homework assignment before you run screaming out the door. So here you go. It's workbook activities A through C for lesson 40. So 40A, 40B, and 40C. It's pages 146 through 148. As far as your whiteboards, um, just erase them. We'll, we'll do some more work with them tomorrow. Um, but for now, the Latin 1 students in period 6 will.